Dr. Gervon Marsh believes in the power of faith, compassion, and unity with a passion for proclaiming the gospel and building the kingdom of God. Dr. Marsh has been involved in guiding and supporting people on their life journeys since 2003. He currently serves as the associate for the Pastoral Ministries Department in the Florida Conference. Dr. Marsh earned a Bachelor of Arts in Religion and Theology, a Master of Divinity, and doctoral studies in advanced expository preaching. His dedication to fostering an inclusive and welcoming environment extends to his personal life as well. Alongside his loving wife, the former Miss Yannick Stobbs, they proudly nurture the hearts of their two bundles of joy, Kelsey and Kyle. After our praise and worship experience, the next voice you will hear will be that of Dr. Gervon Marsh. afternoon church I have to check my my watch really quick make sure I don't say good morning good afternoon church Ooh, this is the day this is the day that the Lord has made I don't think y'all understand that this is the day that the Lord has made let us rejoice and be once I don't think y'all heard me let us rejoice and be once at this moment, I am encouraging my church family to please stand with us and worship with us because God has brought us throughout a trying week. My week could have been trying, your week could have been trying, but God brought us through the entire week to bring us back here to worship together. So wherever you are, lift up your hands, dance, and sing as we worship together as a family.
forevermore. Forever and ever. Who am I? The tiny grain of sand on the beach. God knows it. So if he knows each and every grain of sand, then he knows each and every one of us. He knows our problems. He knows who we are. And he knows that he is the only person that can set us free.
Spirit said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. If you're happy to be in church today, let me hear you say amen. If you're happy to be alive and well, let me hear you say thank you, Jesus. Our God is an awesome God. What do you say? Amen, amen, amen. If you're blessed by the ministry of our praise team and our musicians, let me hear you say amen. Amen, amen. Today, I want to welcome everyone who's here. If you're a member, you're a guest, thank you so much for making New Gen the Church of Worship. And I just want to make one correction. Your pastor claimed that I'm a good friend of New Gen, but he's wrong. I'm actually the associate pastor. You may not see me. <laughs> you may not see me every Sabbath, but I'm here. I'm here in spirit. But it's always good to be here. I want to thank God for the ministry of our pastor, Pastor Reuben Joseph, my friend and brother, and his beautiful wife and children. We thank God for them. This is the cookie. You definitely let him look good. He looks good all the time. And we praise God for you and for the ministry that God continues to effect here. I was impressed this morning as we walked into the bathroom. I said it looked so good, I didn't want to pee in it. It looked so good. It looked so good. But we give God thanks for you. And you see, friends, we can take these things for granted. God's house is made not only for glory, but also for beauty. What do you say? So thank you for your sacrificial giving and for all you're doing to ensure that New Generation is the church of choice and the leading church here in the South. Thank you, thank you, thank you. However you participated in the service today, I want to thank you. And I pray that God will bless you as we continue to worship together. As was mentioned uh, with me today is my beautiful wife and our two beautiful children, Kelsey and Kyle. Yes, initially my daughter's name should have been Gervone. Amen? Hello, somebody? <laughs> And my son should have been Demetrius Maximus, etc., etc. But you know what? God is able. God is able. God is able. And so I thank God for them. You know, um, one day your pastor came to me. We only had one child. And he claimed he is prophesying. Yeah, yeah, no children. He's prophesying. And he prophesied and one came. He prophesied and two came. And then I told him to stop prophesying. <laughs> and then I decided to prophesy over him. In Jesus' name, we're welcoming one more. Somebody say amen. 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 <laughs> amen. God is able, preacher. We, have, we believe in you. We believe in you. So we thank God. We thank God. You deserve that. That's right. <laughs> amen. Amen. I want to greet you on behalf of the ministerial department and let you know that we're so grateful for what God continues to effect here at the New Generation Church. You are one of the leading churches in the conference, dare I say the leading church here in the South. And we praise God for what he continues to do in and through the life and ministry of this church. Stand with me as we turn our attention to God's word, Leviticus chapter 24. Leviticus chapter 24, starting at verse 1. Leviticus, the 24th chapter, starting at verse 1. If you don't mind, I'm going to pull this back a little because I need to hear myself in the monitors. You may want to give me just a little bit more on the monitors. Leviticus 24, verses 1 to 4. I'm reading from the New King James Version. You can follow along in whatever version you have. Leviticus, the 24th chapter starting at verse 1. The Word of God says this. Leviticus 24, verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Command the children of Israel that they bring to you pure oil of pressed olives for the light to make the lamps burn continually outside the veil of the testimony in the tabernacle of meeting. Aaron shall be in charge of it from evening until morning, 
before the Lord continually. It shall be a statute forever in your generation. He shall be in charge of the lamps of the pure gold lampstand before the Lord continually. I want to speak to you briefly on the issue. Keep the fire burning. Bow your heads with me, Father. Thank you so much for your great grace and your great mercies. Bless the reading and readers, the listening and as listeners of your holy word. And our confidence is that you will fulfill the promise of your word. You have said that your word will not return void, but it will accomplish that which you desire. Speak clearly, speak audibly, speak for the honor and glory of your name. As we say thanks in Jesus' name, let God's people say, you may be seated. Keep the fire burning. Keep the fire burning. A story is told, beloved, of a pastor who lived next to, or rather, a man who lived next to a church. And the pastor, being a good pastor, he would always invite this man to church. You see, beloved, the church of God was created for service and to call men and women to know Jesus as Lord and Savior of their lives. And so he knew this man had not given his life to Jesus and he would constantly invite him to come to church. But as much as he would invite him, the man would refuse the invitation. As much as you invite him, the man would uh, find some excuse. Well, one day something unfortunate happened. One day uh, a, a lightning struck the church and the church caught on fire. When the church caught on fire, of course, they called the fire department they call the pastor, they call the elder, they call the deacons, they call everybody. And everybody showed up and they watched as the church was going up in flames. And those who were responsible to deal with it were trying their best to get it done, get it out. Well, the pastor noticed that while that was going on, the man who he had been inviting to church was standing uh, right in front of the church nearby with a big grin on his face. And so the pastor was a little concerned and went over to ask him and have a conversation with the man. And he said to him, all these years I've been inviting you to join us in the building. You wouldn't even step foot on the property. And now that the church is going up in flames, you're standing here with a big grin on your face. I don't understand. Why would you do that? To which the man responded, beloved. And he said to the pastor, preacher... All these years I've been living beside your church and it's the first time I've ever seen your church so hot. It's the first time I've ever seen your church on such fire. Now some of that you missed that it flew right over your head. So let me bring it where you can reach it. In other words, beloved, he was saying to the preacher and to the church members, all these years your church have been here and this is the first time I see your church making a difference in the community. It is a literally a light in the community and everyone is attracted to it. Now let me talk to you, beloved, because I'm telling you that for a reason. New Generation has been here for many years and the question is, is your church on fire for Jesus? Is your church making a difference where it has been planted? Because I want to remind you, friends, the church is not a social club. The church is not here to suit you and me. The church is here to be on fire for God. That's the purpose of the church. And so the question that will confront us today is, is this church on fire for God? And if it's not, how can it be on fire for God? Now I'm sure if I should ask your pastor, if I should ask you, you're going to tell me that the church is on fire for Jesus. Would you agree? Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Well, let's delve therefore into God's word to see and understand what it really means for a church 
or your church to be on fire for Jesus. Because you see, my friends, again, the purpose of church is not here to occupy time and space. The Bible says we are the light of the world. We are here to be on fire for Jesus Christ. For you to understand this, therefore, we want to direct your attention to the book of Leviticus, chapter 24, which relates to us, beloved, something about a very important doctrine, one that is unique to the Seventh-day Adventist church, and that is the doctrine of the sanctuary. You can check the Baptist church, you can check the Methodist church, you can check all these church. None of them teach and preach what we believe as it pertains to the sanctuary. In reality, my friends, the Seventh-day Adventist church came into existence because our pioneers studied the books of Daniel and Revelation, specifically Daniel 8 verse 14, where the Bible says, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Well, they believed that the cleansing of the sanctuary meant that, that God would come to earth and that it represented the return of Jesus Christ when he would clean this earth by fire. And they studied the scriptures, came up with a date, October 22, 1844, and they said Jesus was coming again. But did Jesus come again? No. Why? Because the Bible makes it clear that of the day and of the hour, no man knows when Jesus is coming again. And so they went back to the Word of God and they started studying again. And as they studied, they realized, beloved, that the sanctuary was not the earth, but that there is a literal sanctuary in heaven. I want to let you know today, and hear the preacher, the Bible makes it clear. In Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1 to 9, that we have such a high priest who is in the heavenly sanctuary. And guess what he is doing? The Bible makes it clear that he's interceding in our behalf. In other words, beloved, we have someone who is an advocate before the Father who is pleading the merits of his precious blood and saying, God, I love these ones so much that I died for them and I'm trying to rescue them from sin. I want to let you know today, my friends, I am grateful that I have an advocate in Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that he is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. In other words, if you have pain, Jesus understands about it. If you have no money, Jesus understands about it. If you've gone hungry, Jesus understands about it because he is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. And so the Bible tells us that there's a sanctuary in heaven. And as our pioneers went back and studied about the sanctuary, they found out some interesting things. They realized that the sanctuary, beloved, was the gospel enfolded. In other words, you can study the sanctuary and you will see everything about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me see if I can illustrate this for you. You will notice if you study the sanctuary that firstly there was a courtyard. And in the courtyard when you entered, there was firstly a, a, an altar. It was called the altar of sacrifice. Every morning and every evening, the high priest would offer sacrifice there. And if you sinned, you would bring a sacrifice and that's where it would be offered. You move from the altar, and between the altar and the tabernacle was a big bronze basin. And this is where the high priest would have to wash himself before he entered into the sanctuary because no defilement or anything that was not of God should enter into the sanctuary. You move from there and then you go into the tabernacle itself and you had the holy place 
and then the most holy place. In the holy place, beloved, there were three pieces of furniture. You had the table of shoe bread on the north side. On the south side, you had the seven golden candlesticks. And right before you entered the most holy place, right before the curtain that entered the most holy place, you had the altar of incense where the priest would bring incense and burn on it. You move into the most holy place and in the most holy place there was one particular piece of furniture. It is called the Ark of the Covenant. And in the Ark, beloved, or on the Ark, was a mercy seat. And this mercy seat was made of gold. And on the mercy seat you had two angels. Their wings touched at the top and their wings touched at the bottom and they were looking down into the ark and why were they looking down into the ark beloved because in the ark was the covenant or the ten commandment that God had given to Moses and notice beloved you had the covenant the ten commandment in the ark you had the mercy seat and the angels looking down all of this I'm saying to you represents the gospel of God. How do I know? Let me show you. The Bible says that there's a table of showbread on the north side in the holy place. Let me remind you today, my friend, that Jesus is still the bread of life. <laughs> the Bible makes it clear that he is the bread of life. And he can provide whatever we need where that is concerned. Not only that, Jesus is a light of the world. He makes it clear that he's the light of the world. And then where the altar of incense is concerned, you and I need to know that our prayers are nothing. And our righteousness is like nothing. But when those prayers ascended, they are mingled with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And we are accepted before God. Go into the most holy place and you look into the ark and there you find God's broken law and none of you here no one of us here can say that we are without sin none of us here can say that we haven't failed and that's why though there is a broken law right on top of it is the mercy seat I want to declare today that we should be grateful for the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ God's grace is what's keeping us you know how many times we promise God, oh God, I'm not going to do that no more. Oh God, I'm going to do better next time. And imagine if God treated us like how we treat each other. Every time you break his law, he would give it to you. But somebody ought to understand that even when you fail him, he's more willing to give you grace because you need it. Grace and mercy. And I thank God that there is grace for everyone who needs it today. What do you say? God gives us his grace. God gives us his mercy. That is the essence of the sanctuary service. The gospel unfolded, but don't stop there, my friend. Because one day per year, the day of atonement, which was a capstone of everything that happened in the sanctuary. This was the entire purpose of the sanctuary. You see, beloved, throughout the year, as people came, sins were transferred to the sanctuary. But then the sins had to be cleansed. There were two goats, one for the Lord, one called Azazel, which was like the garbage truck that brought all the sins away. And oh, beloved, you ought to understand that the purpose of the sanctuary is to demonstrate that the blood of Jesus is still able. <laughs> The blood of Jesus is still able. I want to let you know something, my friends. The blood is still able to save today. You see, friends, the blood of Jesus is the currency with which heaven does business. And if you know anything about earthly currencies, you will understand that the U.S. dollar will lose its value. The British pound will lose its value. But can I tell you about the blood of Jesus Christ? The blood will never, ever lose its value. <laughs> Somebody says it reaches to the highest mountain. It flows to the lowest valley. The blood that gives me strength from day to day will never lose its power. If you're grateful for the blood of Jesus, you ought to say amen today. The entire purpose of the sanctuary is to teach us 
that there's power in the blood of Jesus. That's why I like that old song that says, would you be free from your burden of sin? Guess what? There's power in the blood. The sanctuary, therefore, was given so that we understand that the blood of Jesus is able to save us from our sins. And if you're grateful for the blood today, come on, say amen. But now we're still trying to answer the question, is your church on fire for Jesus? The Bible says in Leviticus 24 verse 1 to 4, the Lord spake to Moses saying, command the children of Israel that they bring to you pure oil of pressed olives for the light to make the lamps burn continually outside the veil of the testimony. Now, what that is saying is, in the holy place, outside the veil of the testimony, in the tabernacle of meeting, Aaron shall be in charge of it from evening until morning before the Lord continually. It shall be a statute forever in your generation. He shall be in charge of the lamps on the pure gold lampstand before the Lord continually. Walk with the preacher and follow me intently as we seek to understand how we can be on fire for Jesus. The Bible tells us that in the holy place, there was the golden candlesticks. And we just said that the entire service represents the gospel enfolded. And now we want to learn something from this. Because each piece of furniture in there is very, very important. The question that must firstly therefore be answered has to do with this golden candlesticks. Because that's where we're going to focus today. The golden candlesticks. The question is this, what does it represent? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let me show you what the Bible says. Come with me to Revelation chapter 1, verse 20. We need to understand what the golden candlesticks represents. Listen to Revelation 1, verse 20. Listen to the word of God. The Bible says this. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. Now what I need to tell you is this. When you read scripture, you will find the golden lampstand in three places. You will find it in the books of Moses. You will find it in Zechariah. And you will find it in Revelation. And the Bible says in Revelation chapter 1 verse 20, The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand. And the seven golden lampstands. And listen to this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. So the golden lampstand represents the church of God. What does it represent? The church of God. Now this is very interesting and this is very important because watch this, watch this, watch this. The golden lampstands that we see here in Revelation, they are not on earth, they are in heaven. And my question to you is this. In heaven, is there anything that is impure? Is there anything that is not 100% uh, 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 perfect? Not at all. Everything in heaven is good. And the Bible says the golden lamps stand in heaven represent the church. Now, is the church yet in heaven? No, you're still on earth. I hope you know that, right? So my question to you is, if the golden lamp stands represents God's church, this brings us to a very interesting thing. You see, my friend, is the church of earth on God perfect? Yeah, 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 yeah. You don't want to answer me. Let me try that again. Is the church of God on earth perfect? Now I'm glad you said that because watch this. People ought to understand that as long as the church is on earth, it will be the church militant. Which means that the church may not be perfect, but the God of the church is a perfect God. Can I say that again? The church may not be perfect, but the God of the church is a perfect God. And this brings me to something else which is very important. You ought to understand that the God of the church is perfect. And he will make his church perfect in his time. 
You're not called to make the church perfect. I'm not called to make the church perfect because we can do it. And the problem is this. The church will never be perfect because you are in it and I'm in it. <laughs> but one day, God will make his church perfect. Somebody say amen. amen. But not only that, the Bible says the church is represented by the golden lampstand. And this emphasizes something else that I said earlier, which is simply this. The Bible makes it clear that we are the light of the world. We are the what? Read it in Matthew 5 verse 14 onward. And my question to you is this. Anybody here has ever seen dark light? Hello? Hello? What about fresh salt? Have you ever tasted fresh salt? Hello? The Bible says we're the salt of the earth and it says we're the light of the world. Let me tell you something. If we're the light of the world, we need to be the light of the world. Light is light. Darkness is darkness. The church is the light, which means the church can look, behave, act, and continue to do things like the world. We must be distinct from the world. You don't want to say amen. I'll say it for you. Amen. The church is not the world. The church is the light of the world. We're called to make a difference where we are. So how can we make a difference where we are? How can we be the light? I'm glad you asked. Come back with me to Leviticus. Listen to this. Listen to what the Bible says. Three things. Three things. Number one, the Bible says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Command the children of Israel that they bring to you pure oil of pressed olives for the light to make the lamps burn continually. In other words, Moses was instructed by God that he should tell the people they must bring pure oil and the purpose for the oil was so the lights in the sanctuary would burn continually. In other words, they were never to go out. They must always be burning. And it says outside the veil of the testimony in the tabernacle of meetings. And notice this. Aaron shall be in charge of it from evening until morning before the Lord continually. In other words, all day Aaron was supposed to ensure that the lights kept burning. Now the question is this, who is Aaron? Aaron is the high priest. Now we said earlier that the lamps represent the church according to Revelation 1.20. You are the light. You are the lamp. We are the lamps. Now the question is this. Who is our high priest? Jesus is our high priest. And it brings us to the first point, therefore, how we must keep our lights burning. Look what Aaron had to do. The Bible says Aaron was in charge of it. Look at Exodus 30 verse 7. Exodus 30 verse 7 says this. Aaron shall burn on it sweet incense every morning when he tends the lamps. He shall burn incense on it. And when Aaron lights the lamps at twilight, he shall burn incense on it. The emphasis there is Aaron the high priest must light the lamps and he must do it morning and evening, keeping it burning. But is Aaron alive? No, he's dead. Is Aaron our high priest? No, he's dead. Who is our high priest? Jesus. Folks, if we're going to keep our lights burning, if we're going to make a difference... The first thing you ought to understand is this. Our high priest must light our lights every morning and every evening. Can I say that again? If this church is going to make a difference where it is individually, our high priest must light our lamps every morning and every evening. And who is our high priest? Jesus. And how is he going to light our lamps? Let me be very practical with you. If Jesus is going to light your lamp every morning and every evening, it means you must spend time studying the word of God and in prayer. Let me tell you something. It is an interesting thing that many of us call ourselves Christians and Seventh-day Adventist Christians. And every day we get up 
and we go out and we come in and we treat God like a stepchild. We don't read our Bibles. We don't pray. We don't pray in our families. We don't worship in our families. But I'm saying to you, if Jesus is going to light your light every morning and every evening, you must spend time studying the word together as a family in the morning before you go out and in the evening when you come in, you must spend time in family worship and personal worship because the only way Jesus can light your life is if you are studying his word. Here's a question for you. How many of you drove to church today? How many of you drove to church today? How many of you? All right, all right. A few of you. How many of you have a spare tire in your car? Oh, Lord of mercy. They don't know if they have a spare tire in their car, Jesus. <laughs> you, you're sure? Here's the next question. How many of you know the condition of your spare tire? Don't tell no lying church now. <laughs> but here's the next question. When do you think about your spear tire? <laughs> hey, hey, can I tell you something? That's how we treat God. Some of us treat God like we treat our spear tire. You don't think about him. You don't, you don't spend time with him. You ignore him. But when you're in trouble, then you want to call on him. You should be glad God is not like Pastor Marsh. Because if you only called me when you need me, I would ignore you. But somebody ought to understand that the God I serve is a God of grace and mercy. Because when you call, he will answer. He will be there for you. God is a good God. God. Oh, my friends, let me tell you something. You know how many times you're driving on 95 and the devil arranged circumstances for a big rig tractor trailer to mow you down. But the angel of the Lord that encampeth round about them that fear him stepped in time and dealt with it. And I'm saying to you, if God is such a good God, before you go out, consecrate yourself to him. And when you come in, say, thank you, Jesus, for being so good to me. You have to spend time with God. Family worship is important. Personal worship is important. God should not be treated like your spear tire. Don't just call on him when you're in an emergency. Spend time with God. Let him light your light every morning and every evening. Folk, you can't call yourself a Christian family if you're not worshiping God together every morning and every evening. You must spend time with God. And let me show you something about the Bible. Let me show you something about the Bible. Let me ask you a question. How many of you can honestly say that in this week that is about to end, because there are seven days, this is the last day of the week, you have spent quality time reading God's word? Don't, don't raise your hand, don't raise because I don't want to put anybody out there. But let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. The word of God... It's not cake for special occasion. It's bread for daily use. Hello, somebody. The word of God is not cake for special occasion. You don't treat the word of God like wedding cake. How often you eat wedding cake? Or every birthday. No. You need to have some weddings, preacher. You need to have some weddings. We must spend time... In the word of God and in prayer. So let me challenge you. Let me challenge you. Let me challenge you. You see for this upcoming week. Spend time every morning. And every evening. Reading the word of God. You see before you go on social media. Or you go on Twitter. Or whatever it's called now. Facebook. On X. Whatever. Spend time with God. The high priest can't light your light if you're not spending time with God. And why do you think people give so much trouble in church? Why do you think sometimes the church is powerless? It's because if we're not praying individually, we can't make up for it when we come to church on Sabbath. You ought to be praying families. You ought to be praying members. You must be praying consistently and studying the word of God. Somebody say amen. 
You want God to light your life? You want the high priest to light your life? Aaron had to do it every morning and evening. Jesus is not going to come down here right now to come spend time with you, so to speak. But you can spend time with him in prayer and in the study of the word. You know what's amazing? Ellen White says that Jesus saw prayer as a necessity. And if he who is the son of God saw how important prayer was and he never sinned, and what about you? What about me? If the high priest is going to light your life, spend time with God in prayer and Bible study. Somebody say amen. If God's going to light your life, something else we need to do. Number two, number two, this, we find this one in the third candlestick in Revelation. In Revelation chapter 1, I want to read this one for you. Revelation 1 verse 12. Listen to this. The Bible says, Then I turned to see the voice that spoke to me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. There it is again. We read it in Leviticus. Here it is in Revelation. And in the midst of the seven lampstand, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. Now watch this. Watch this. The Bible says that John the Revelator sees seven golden lampstands in heaven. And then he sees the Son of Man. And who is the Son of Man? That's Jesus. And notice where he sees the Son of Man. Notice where he sees the Son of Man. The Bible says, and in the midst. In other words, in the middle. Now, while it is important that Jesus lights our life individually and in our families, when we come together corporately, he will light our life if we put Jesus in his proper place. And where does Jesus need to be? In the, in the, in the midst, in the center. Let me tell you something. I've had the privilege of being a pastor for a number of years now. And it never fails that you go to church oftentimes. And people put everything but Jesus at the center of the church. Yeah, you're going quiet on the preacher now. People put politics. People put power. People with personality at the center of the church instead of Jesus. But I've got news for you, my friend. If this church is going to be on fire for Jesus, the only person who needs to be at the center of the church is Jesus Christ. I've heard of churches that split because they couldn't agree on the paint on the wall or on the carpet on the floor. That's what happens when Jesus is not at the center. But when Jesus is at the center, oh, I promise you, we will be on fire for him. My friend, hear the preacher and hear the preacher clearly. When Jesus is at the center of the church, members are going to be drawn closer to each other. How do I know? If Jesus is at the center and we are all are drawing closer to him, it is inevitable that we will draw closer to each other. If Jesus is at the center, there's going to be unity in the church. If Jesus is at the center, the church is going to make a difference in the community. If Jesus is at the center, people won't be fighting over church position and church offices if Jesus is at the center the church will be what God wants it to be so here the preacher today if you want your church to be on fire make sure there's only one person at the center his name is J-E-S-U-S Jesus and when Jesus is at the center of the church my friend in his proper position in right relation to the church, everything will be what it needs to be. Oh, my friends, hear the preacher clearly. Hear the preacher clearly. I've seen and come to realize that many times we put everything but Jesus at the center. The question is this. Can any of these things save us? Which is why Jesus says, I, I be lifted up. I will draw all men to me. If Jesus is lifted up, if Jesus is at the center... He will have his right position. And the church is going to be on fire for Jesus Christ. But then number three, number three as we're wrapping up. Pastor told me I need to be out of here by one o'clock. Pray for me, pray for me, pray for me. Zechariah chapter four. I want to show you the third candlestick. Zechariah chapter four. Zechariah four. Listen to this, listen to this. 
Now the angel who talked with me came back and wakened me as one man wakened out of his sleep and said to me, what do you see? So I said, I am looking and there is a lampstand of solid gold with a bowl on top of it and on the stand seven lamps with seven pipes to the seven lamps. Two olive trees are by it, one on the right and the other on the left. So I answered and spoke to the angel who talked with me saying, what are these, my Lord? Look what's going on here. We read in Leviticus, Aaron was supposed to tend the lamp as the people brought the oil. We just saw in Revelation that the lampstands are in heaven. And now Zechariah is saying that he got a vision. Zechariah relates a vision that Zerubbabel got. And there's a golden lampstand with seven pipes and two olive trees that brings the oil into it. And when the uh, uh, angel of the Lord spoke to Zechariah and showed him what was going on, he said, do you understand what is going on? Verse 5, then the angel who talked with me answered and said, do you not know what these? And he said, no, my Lord. So I answered and said, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. Walk with the preacher, walk with the preacher. We're going somewhere. Zerubbabel and Joshua were building God's temple. They had met difficulty. The people had stopped giving. The people weren't uh, uh, supporting the building project anymore. And they were getting discouraged. And God had to give this vision of the golden lampstand, which represents the church, and said to him, this church is going to be built. But how is it going to be built? Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. Ah, church of God, if God is going to light our lives every morning and every evening, and if he's going to be at the center and make a difference, how is he going to do it? The Bible says, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. Let me tell you something. Seventh-day Adventists need to repent. Because oftentimes we give the impression that we are a spiritless church. We give the impression that we don't believe in the Holy Spirit. And we let others take over the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. And talk all sorts of nonsense. Claiming that when you're filled with the Spirit, you're going to be talking a Shalom Shamba, Ustalama Honda, and all of these things. But the question is, is that how the Spirit of God works? That's not how the Spirit of God works. But the Bible says that there is power when the Spirit is in the church of God. Not by might, nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. Now what is this talking about? Now we don't believe that when you have the Spirit, you carry on like you have no sense. You must have heard about the preacher who one day told the church to get in the Spirit and everybody got in the Spirit including his wife and she fell on the ground and was in a convulsion and another church brother saw what was going on. He too got the Spirit and fell on the pastor's wife. <laughs> And in the spirit on the pastor wife, the pastor jumped off the podium, grabbed him and slapped him a couple of times and said, wrong spirit, my brother, wrong spirit. You see, God's spirit don't work like that. Come on, say man. God's spirit don't work like that. How does the spirit work? Well, the Bible tells us. Let me tell you what the Bible says. Watch this, watch this, watch this. Galatians 5, Galatians 5. Listen to this in verse 22. The Bible says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faith, self-control. Against such there is no law. If you want to know if you have the Spirit, it will then be demonstrated by the fruit of the Spirit in the church of God. Somebody say amen. amen. The Bible says the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. So let me ask you something now. Do you have the Spirit? <laughs> because the point is, according to the Word of God, if you have the Spirit, it's going to be evident by the fruit. And the question is this. Let's look at the fruit. The fruit consists of love. Do you love each other? Hello? Do you love each other? Because if you don't love each other, you can't be on fire for God. 
How can you claim that you love God when you can't even love your fellow church member? And what fire would you be on? Nothing but strange fire. What about this one? Look at this one. Joy. Can I talk to you about that for a minute? There's some people who give the impression that Christianity kills joy. But I've got news for you. In his presence, there is fullness of joy. At his right hand are pleasures forevermore. Christians must be happy in Jesus Christ. Don't give the impression that wherever you go, Christians are gloomy and dead. And like the little girl who was coming home one day and saw a donkey with a long face. And the preacher had said to her, you can't be so excited in church. You need to calm down. And then the, ah, uh, because those who have religion are calm people. And then she looked at the donkey and said, donkey, you must have religion. Because you look just like those people in church. Somebody ought to understand that when you have joy, it will be evident in praising God for his goodness to us. What about peace? Hey, some of us are warlike. Let me tell you something. The Bible says it's a dragon who was wrath. So if you're behaving like that, you're a dragon Christian. You're not a child of God because a child of God are peaceable people. Yeah, yeah, you don't want to say amen, I'll say it for you. Amen. Some of us, all we do is look for something to fuss and fight about. We're always looking for a contention. We're always looking for something to speak against the pastor, to speak against the elder, to speak about all these things. What you need to do is have love, joy, and some peace in your heart. Long suffering. Oh my friend, you have to understand that when you come, when it comes on to Christianity, if Jesus could be on a cross and say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Let them do what they want to do to you. God will take care of it in his time. You have to learn to suffer long. What about this one? kindness some of us are so unkind we look at people the wrong way we talk to people the wrong way we rub people the wrong way and we claim that's just who i am and that's the problem because that's who you are you need to be like jesus the bible says that if you want to be on fire for jesus you must be filled with the spirit come on say amen and when you're filled with the Spirit, it will be evident by the fruit of the Spirit. Listen, I don't care how much you know about the Word of God. If you don't have the Spirit in your life, you think you know the Bible better than the devil. But does he have the Spirit? No. The Bible makes it clear that if you want to be filled one minute, want to be on fire for Jesus, you must be filled with the Spirit. But let me show you something even more interesting now. Because the Bible talks about the fruit of the Spirit. But it also talks about the gift of the Spirit. Won't be able to read it, but read uh, Romans 12. Read 1 Corinthians 12. Read uh, uh, Ephesians 4. And it talks about the gifts. So the Bible says he gives to the church some that are pastors, some that are teachers, some that are evangelists. And the list goes on and on. If you can sing, God has given you that gift. Whatever it is. But the question is this. Hear the preacher now. Which comes first? The fruit of a spirit or the gift of the spirit? Hello? Which comes first? The fruit of a spirit or the gift of a spirit? Let me tell you something. If you have or claim you have the gift of a spirit, but you don't have the fruit of a spirit, all you have is a talent. You might as well enter America Got Talent. Because watch this. Paul gives a list of the gifts of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12. And as soon as he's done, in 1 Corinthians 13 he says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm become as a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. Let me tell you something, my friend. I don't care how gifted you are. Your gift is of no value until you're filled with the Spirit of God. 
How can we be on fire for Jesus? Number one, let Jesus light your life every morning and every evening. Study the word of God. Somebody say amen. I'm challenging you, church of God, this week, this week, this week. I don't know about you, but I can tell you this. It's in my personal life. Anytime I fail to spend time with God and his word, trust me, trouble. And the devil brings all sorts of problems. And when I spend time with him, it doesn't mean the problems don't come, but I'm more fortified to stand with Jesus Christ. <laughs> Study the word of God. Every morning and every evening. The word of God is not bread, not cake for special occasion. It's bread for daily use. Don't treat God like your spare tire. Seek him in prayer. Number two, corporately, put Jesus at the center of the church. Don't put no person, no power, no politics. Let Jesus be there. And number three, let the fruit of the Spirit be manifested in your life so that the gift of the Spirit can be used to build God's church and for this church to be on fire for Jesus Christ. Years ago, while pastoring in Jamaica, I'll never forget this, I was doing an evangelistic series and there was a man who was attending every night, attending from another church. And every good evangelist knows it's not only good to preach, you need to visit the people in their homes. So visit to them, start to, 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 to talk with them about the word of God and, 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 and he believed everything. He believed in the Sabbath. He believed in the state of the dead. He believed in the second coming. He believed in the sanctuary. And then when you ask him, if you believe all these things, what is the problem? Why won't you be baptized? And the man said, see he was a member of another church and then he said this to me, preacher, I can't leave the fireside and come into a refrigerator. According to him, the church of God was cold. The church of God was not on fire for Jesus. Oh, my friends, new generation can continue to be the church God wants it to be. But it would only do that if you, the members, understand that individually and as your families, Jesus needs to light the light of your life every morning and every evening. Corporately, he must be at the center. And the only way he'll be at the center and light your life is when the fruit of the Spirit is used to fuel the gift of the Spirit so that we can make a difference for Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for joining us. We pray that this worship experience transformed your soul, refreshed your hearts, and renewed your spirit. New Generation is a multicultural church that loves God and loves people. It is our desire that you have a life-changing encounter with the creator of the universe. We are located at 12800 North Miami Avenue in the beautiful city of North Miami, Florida. Please feel free to interact with us on our social media platforms, like us on Facebook, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and follow us on Instagram. Thank you for joining us. Please join us next time for another worship experience.